Hi, welcome back to PLS 101, American Democracy and Citizenship. I'm Patrick Scott, and today we're going to continue our discussion of civil liberties. We're going to be looking at different provisions of the Bill of Rights, including, for example, the Fourth Amendment, Fifth Amendment, uh, the right to privacy, and see what the courts have said about these various types of civil liberties. And again, just to go ahead and keep all this in perspective, if you remember why we have the Bill of Rights to begin with, this was basically an accommodation to the states by the Federalists to, in order to ratify the Constitution, these were designed to place very clear restrictions on what the federal government could or could not do. So we've been talking about freedom of religion, freedom of speech, and, and how the courts have interpreted these over time. Now, today I want to start out by talking about the Fourth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment deals with freedom from unreasonable searches and seizures. And going back again in terms of our history during our, the colonial period, judges who were sympathetic to the British Crown would issue something called writs of assistance. And basically, it would allow the British to come in and to search and to ransack homes. And so the purpose of the Fourth Amendment was to prevent intrusions like these by, you know, by the government. Now, when we talk about freedom from unreasonable searches and seizures today, we often are talking about these in terms of police searches. What constitutes unreasonable search? What constitutes unreasonable seizures? Well, again, in some countries, the police can gather evidence any way that they see fit, and they are allowed legally to introduce that evidence into court, no matter how it was obtained. So you can be convicted in many countries of a crime, even though the evidence is tainted. Well, by contrast, in the United States, improperly gathered evidence is excluded from admission into trial in the first place. Even if that evidence is relevant to someone's guilt, um, it's excluded from consideration. And therefore, many criminals in the past have gone free just because the police officer somehow blundered. Um, and if nothing else, it makes police very much, very, very careful in terms of what they do and how they do it because they have to make sure that their actions will stand up in court. And again, all of this is based upon a principle known as the exclusionary rule. Basically, it states that evidence gathered in violation of the Constitution cannot be used in a trial against you, no matter how incriminating. And that rule has been used in connection with the Fourth Amendment as well as the Fifth Amendment. Again, the Fourth Amendment deals with unreasonable searches and seizures. The Fifth Amendment relates to the idea of self-incrimination. So, if the police carried out an unreasonable search and or obtained an improper confession, then this evidence is gathered in violation of the Constitution and thus cannot be used in a trial. And this applied particularly at the federal level, but not necessarily at the state level. Now there's a, a very important court case in 1961. This was called Mapp versus Ohio. Um, a few years, years er earlier, um, the, the, the police in Cleveland um, broke into a home of a lady named Dolly Mapp and they were looking for narcotics or drugs, but they found none, um, but some kind of illegal substances. They ransacked her belongings, and in the process, they found some obscene pictures, and therefore, she was arrested. Now, this case went before the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ruled that this was an unreasonable search and seizure because, first of all, the police did not obtain a search warrant. They had plenty of time to do so, but they did not. And further, the court, in using the, the exclusionary rule, stated that the obscene pictures, even though they were considered obscene, they were gathered illegally, and therefore, because they were without a search warrant, and they could therefore not be used as evidence against her. Um, and so, what was really important here is that the Supreme Court extended the federal exclusionary rule to the states here, said the states are required to follow the federal exclusionary, the, this exclusionary rule as well. That was considered a constitutional um, uh, requirement in order, to via, in order to prevent violation of the Fourth Amendment. So, what does that mean today? When can the police search you without it being unreasonable? Well, three basic circumstances. Um, if the police have a search warrant, if the police have lawfully arrested you, and also if there's this idea of probable cause. But again, there are some restrictions involved here. When the police have arrested you, for example, they are allowed to search you, 
things in plain view, and things or places under your immediate control. But, so as an example of this, this means that the police can search, say, the room in which you're arrested, but not other rooms in the house. Uh, in this case, if the police want to search the rest of the house, they first have to obtain a search warrant. If the police, in this case, want to search your car, they first have to obtain a search warrant. Now, speaking of cars, what if you were arrested while driving your car? How much can the police search there? And that, cha that, that answer has changed over time, but basically the latest is this, is that any part of your car can be searched if there is a reasonable expectation, probable cause, that you are carrying something illegal or if you are, say, for example, in hot pursuit. In those cases, no warrant is first required. If the officer stops you and finds something in plain sight, the officer has the right to seize that as evidence without violating the Constitution. And what I want you to understand here and see is that this issue really does involve a balance of rights. It's a balancing of interests. It's the rights of society to be protected versus the rights of the individual. Now, meanwhile, I should also point out that the court has become more, more and more sympathetic to society's interest in law enforcement. And it's not penalizing, the courts have not, are, are not penalizing the police for making mistakes um, in an attempt to make a good faith effort. So, for example, the court has recognized exceptions to the exclusionary rule in situations where the police have conducted a search in good faith using a warrant that was later found to be defective. So, for example, accidentally the, you know, the police meant to go to a certain address and the address that was typed was uh, 336 Walnut Street and it should be 363 Walnut Street. They went to the correct address that they, they were trying to, to obtain but the, the search warrant was defective. In a situation like that, the courts have said, and they've been sympathetic to the police, they said that they've tried to obtain a, a warrant making a good faith e effort and so just because they had the wrong address does not invalidate uh, or does not create an unreasonable search and seizure. Now, along with that, we talk about the Fifth Amendment, uh, confession and self-incrimination. Um, for many years, the Supreme Court held that involuntary confessions could not be used in federal criminal trials, but the court had not ruled that they were, those involuntary confessions were barred from state criminal trials. In other words, for a long time, involuntary confessions could be used in state criminal trials. If you confessed to something, no matter how you were coerced, that if evidence could be used against you. But this all changed with Miranda versus Arizona, which was a court case ruled in 1966. And the issue here was whether there was an involuntary confession. Uh, this person, Miranda, had been arrested for raping and kidnapping a young woman. And after two hours of questioning or so um, by the police, he signed a confession. Now, here are the facts of the case. Miranda had actually committed the crime, but he had not been fully informed of his right to be silent or to have an attorney present with him during questioning. Uh, so M Miranda did not have a lawyer present and he did not knowingly give up his right to a lawyer. Consequently, because of this case, his confession was considered involuntary and it should have been excluded from evidence in the trial. Okay? Now, and, and again, in the federal court case up to this point, it would have been excluded in the state. It was not because the states were allowed to do this. But with this case, the Supreme Court overturned his state conviction and he went free. So basically, involuntary confessions are not allowed in state trials, all right? So in other words, what they're basically doing is they're taking federal provisions and extending them to the states. Interestingly, as a footnote here, uh, Miranda was later killed in a barroom fight shortly thereafter. Um, in 1984, the court stated this about illegal confessions. The court stated that an illegal confession does not throw a case out altogether if other evidence was sufficient to lead to a, to a conviction. In such cases, an illegal confession well, would not have been needed anyway in light of the other evidence and therefore the illegal confession should not throw the entire court case out. And that's the courts basically said that in 1984. Now, um, in the Sixth Amendment talks about the right to a trial by jury and the right to have an attorney. Very important court case pertaining to the Sixth Amendment was Gideon versus Wainwright that was settled in 1963. 
<clears throat> and like Miranda versus Arizona, we're seeing a trend here. In Gideon versus Wainwright, this basically made the Sixth Amendment apply to the states. Um, there's a person from Hannibal, Missouri named Clarence Earl Gideon. He was a drifter and he was down in Florida. He was arrested because he had committed a crime. His crime was breaking and entering into a pool hall uh, early Sunday morning at 2 a.m. or so. Clarence Earl Gideon was serving a five-year sentence. He did not have a right, and this again was in Florida, he did not have an attorney uh, representing him. And he, as he was sitting in his jail cell, he was thinking, you know, a lawyer sure would have helped me here, I think. He believed that without a lawyer, you know, um, he, he was not getting the full, you know, he, he ended up basically getting, getting the full uh, amount of penalty because of not having good representation. But he could not afford a lawyer, and so he defended in himself. And in his trial in Florida, um, he was defending himself against the charge of breaking and entering. He did not do a very good job of defending himself. <clears throat> and if he had not, I'm sorry, if he had obtained a lawyer, he might not have obtained the maximum sentence of five years. Um, and this was a case, interestingly, in which the defendant was, you know, was not incompetent per se, and the judge was trying to make every effort to protect his rights, but yet close examination of the facts showed that he was repeatedly hurt by lack of counsel. And so his, he was sitting in his jail cell. He wrote a letter to the Supreme Court <coughs> saying, <coughs> excuse me, please look at my case here. The Supreme Court looked at his case and, 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 and ordered the record up and the Supreme Court ended up siding with Gideon. They said, the Supreme Court said that Gideon should have had a right to an attorney. And so his conviction was overturned. Basically the argument was that Gideon, without having a lawyer, was deprived of the due process, guarantee, the due process protections that were guaranteed by the 14th Amendment to the Constitution. So before this case here, the Supreme Court said that the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment does not provide an automatic or absolute guarantee of a lawyer in a state criminal trial. So basically what we have here is the court taking a process of using the 14th Amendment and as a, as a door or as a vehicle or a mechanism to make different parts of the Bill of Rights apply to the states. And let me, again, let me talk a little bit about and digress just a bit about the 14th Amendment. What does the 14th Amendment do? What does the 14th Amendment say? The 14th Amendment says, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within this jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. So basically what the 14th Amendment was designed to do, it's got two particular provisions, the Equal Protection Clause and the Due Process Clause, and it's designed to make the Bill of Rights apply to the states. Now originally, go back to what we said before, the Bill of Rights were understood to limit the actions, the first 10 amendments were designed to limit the actions of just the national government. If there were any restrictions placed on the states, it was only by their own individual state constitutions. And in 1833, a very, very famous court case, Barron versus Baltimore, was basically uh, reaffirmed the idea that the Bill of Rights was intended to apply to limit the actions of the national government only. Okay? The 14th Amendment, however, passed years later, some 50 years later, essentially overturns Barron versus Baltimore because it's designed to apply the Bill of Rights to the states. So the, the 14th Amendment was passed in 1868, and since the passage of the 14th Amendment, the Supreme Court has made the Bill of Rights apply selectively to the states. Before a long time, but for a long time, however, there was no wholesale incorporation of the Bill of Rights to the states. All right? Instead, there's been what's called a process of selective incorporation, and I want you to understand this. This is basically a long process through a number of cases over a period of years where the Supreme Court has selectively applied more and more provisions of the Bill of Rights to the states via the 14th Amendment. Interestingly, as late as 1922, the Supreme Court said that the protections of the First Amendment, free speech, free press, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, did not apply to the states. As late as 1922. Um, and in fact, 
Over time, the Supreme Court was even more reluctant to apply to the states the guarantees of fair criminal procedure. Uh, the states were entitled to apply their own criminal law, uh, and that would apply, of course, with the Sixth Amendment, the right to have an attorney. But beginning in the 1920s or so, the Supreme Court began to rule increasingly in favor of making the Bill of Rights apply to the states. And again, that's the process of selective incorporation. And that's what we've seen occurring over that period of time. And so we saw that with Miranda versus Arizona. We saw that with Gideon versus Wainwright. Okay? Now, we saw that with uh, Mapp versus Ohio. Those are all examples that we've been talking about where we're seeing the process of selective incorporation taking place. And so if you think about this, I mean, over 100 years since the passage of the 14th Amendment is still not a wholesale incorporation. And interestingly, even today, not all of the Bill of Rights have been incorporated at the state level. I mean, there are still provisions, there's yet to be test cases for this. There are still provisions in our Constitution, in our Bill of Rights that have not applied to the state level. And I'll give you an example. Amendment 2. There has yet to be a test case for Amendment 2. Technically speaking, a state could pass a very stringent gun restriction law and that law would may remain in effect until a lawsuit finally reached the Supreme Court. Now that hasn't happened and the states do provide and believe very much in promoting the Second Amendment, but theoretically a state could do that. Now um, other, other amendments have yet to be incorporated or different parts of different amendments have yet to be incorporated. For example, part of the Seventh Amendment, the right to a trial by jury in civil cases uh, where the amount of money in dispute is greater than twenty dollars. Uh, part of the Eighth Amendment, the ban on excessive bail and fines, uh, the ban on peacetime quartering of soldiers in private homes, the Third Amendment. All those are examples where parts have yet to be fully incorporated. Now I should point out, going back to that Second Amendment, there was a recent court case uh, that did put a restriction on the District of Columbia's uh, law about, about gun control. But again, uh, I want you to understand there is a, a part of this, the point here is that this idea of selective incorporation, there still is not completely um, an entire wholesale incorporation of the Bill of Rights at this point in time. But for a good portion, it certainly is. Um, let's look at the Eighth Amendment. This is also an important amendment. This is pro prohibition against cruel and an unusual punishment. Um, the Eighth Amendment pro uh, forbids excessive fines and the use of cruel and unusual punishment. And then under this, basically what it says is that the government is prohibited from using barbaric forms of punishment, such as torture, and it also forbids a punishment that is grossly disproportionate to the crime committed. And so, for example, let me give you some, 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 some uh, examples of this. Uh, the court found that a life sentence uh, without the possibility of for parole that was excessive for a person convicted of writing a hundred dollar bad check. But there was a court case where somebody wrote a bad check and they ended up getting a life sentence without the possibility of parole. parole. That went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said that violates the Eighth Amendment. But interestingly, in 1980, the court upheld a life sentence imposed on, on a man for three thefts that totaled for about $300. And in this case, uh, this particular state had a law that said that you would get a mandatory life sentence if you were convicted of three felonies. In this case, it was a total amount of $300, $289, but it was still uh, considered appropriate. In 2003, the Supreme Court upheld long sentences that were meted out under uh, the three-time uh, three uh, offender law. And they said also that prison terms of 25 years to life is not too harsh for a small-time thief who shoplifted golf clubs. California had a, has a three strikes in your outlaw, and basically in 2003 the Supreme Court said that this law does not necessarily lead to cruel and unusual punishment. So even though a relatively minor crime can yield a life term, um, if the criminal already had a felony record, and they said that was, that was still within the parameters and scope of, of, of not being unconstitutional. Now, when we talk about cruel and unusual punishment, uh, that brings us to an interesting question. Is the death penalty cruel and unusual punishment? Different members of the court have ta taken different views over the years. One famous case was Furman versus Georgia in 1972. And here the Supreme Court said that the death penalty is not cruel and unusual punishment, but 
states have to be fair and consistent in how they apply the death penalty. In this case, it was not applied fairly. And in this in, in instance, the Supreme Court ruled against this instance of the death penalty. But on the other hand, as long as states apply it fairly and consistently across the board and are not discriminatory in their practices, then the death penalty was not a violation of the Eighth Amendment. Okay? So basically what they're suggesting here is that two people who have similar situations and similar, you know, in, in regards to their background, but similar situations, similar types of crime would get the same type of sentence. It cannot be inconsistently and indiscriminately applied. If, for example, in, in Georgia's case, if, if um, African Americans were getting the death penalty much more to greater rate proportion than whites, for example, then that would be a good example where the death penalty would be a violation of the Eighth Amendment. Now, today, the, you know, the Supreme Court has been reluctant to overturn uh, a number of death sentences, and so some scholars have suggested that the number of executions uh, is expected to increase dramatically over the next 10 years. And a couple of other things I will say about this too, about the death penalty. What about mitigating conditions like mental retardation? Can someone with this condition be executed? And the answer, according to the court, is possibly so. Someone, um, it would not necessarily violate the Eighth Amendment. As long as you're careful to take a person's mental level of mental retardation into account, um, and you are actively you know, taking it into account, then, but still convicting them, that could still consider to be not a violation of the Eighth Amendment. What about age? Can someone be ex executed for a crime if they committed a crime under the age of 18? In this case, the answer is no. If a person committed a crime under the age of 18, uh, killed somebody, for example, the death penalty would not apply in their case because that would violate the Eighth Amendment according to the most recent court cases on that matter. All right, let's move into another discussion, another right called the right to privacy. Now in this case, there is technically no specific amendment that says we have a right to privacy. But the courts in a number of cases, have, the Supreme Court has said that basically um, we can infer various provisions in the Constitution and specifically the Bill of Rights um, that create this umbrella of privacy. And this point was particularly reinforced in an important court case called Griswold versus Connecticut. Um, and this was in, I believe, 1965. Here, there was a doctor that was convicted under Connecticut law that made it illegal to provide birth control devices or give instructions in their use to a married couple. The Supreme Court said basically such a law unduly interfered with a married couple's right to privacy. So the physician was, was, uh, uh, you know, was allowed you know, to, to go free. Um, that, that conviction was ruled invalid. Uh, when we think about right to privacy, we also think about abortion-related cases, and of course the most famous is Roe v. Wade of 1973. And of course in Roe v. Wade in 1973, the courts basically created a three-trimester trimester standard. And essentially in the first trimester of pregnancy, uh, the decision to have an abortion rests with the woman. Uh, in the second trimester, the court said that the state can get involved, government can get involved to some degree in regulating the practice of abortion, such as, for example, mandating that the abortion be performed in a hospital in order to protect the life and health of the mother. Only in the third trimester can a state prohibit the practice of abortion altogether. And as you know, in terms of the importance of the court cases and everything, I mean, every single year, there's always a major march in Washington by people who, who believe in the right to life and who are opposed to Roe versus Wade. And on the anniversary of Roe versus Wade every year, there'll be thousands of people who, who come to Washington from all around the nation, who come to the nation's capital and, and who gather in a huge massive demonstration and march um, from the Capitol to the White House in pro and to the Supreme Court of uh, protesting Roe versus Wade. And then you'll see at the very, very same time another crowd that gathers basically in support of choice who believe in the provisions of Roe versus Wade and, and, and see the necessity of, of keeping reproductive choice in the, uh, intact based upon that decision. Now, since that point in time, in the, in the 1980s and the 1990s, uh, that the, uh, the issue of abortion has been modified through other court cases. 
And basically what we've seen here is a trend that the states are becoming increasingly allowed uh, to regulate a woman's right to choose. And one of the important court cases happened in 1989, and this qualified Roe versus Wade in a lot of fundamental ways. And this was in a Missouri case that originated out of Missouri, and this was called Webster versus Reproductive Health Services. And what the court said basically is that the states could be uh, allowed to, to further regulate abortion, and in particular in this case, uh, it said that state employees, if you are paid for by the states, a physician by the state, for example, you could be prohibited from performing an abortion. Um, states could ban the use of public facilities, public hospitals, for example, in performing abortions. And also, in this case, it required doctors to conduct tests of viability to determine if the fetus could exist outside the mother's womb. So essentially, what this court case meant was that it permitted the states to exercise more control in state legislators to pass laws that would permit more control in terms of regulating abortion. Another important court case occurred in 1992, and, and this was Planned Parenthood of Southeastern Pennsylvania versus Casey. And basically, this upheld, further upheld state restrictions on abortion. Um, for example, there was an issue about uh, being counseled on the risk and alternatives to abortion. Is that something that states could do or require people to provide to, mother, to, to, to women who are contemplating an abortion? And basically, it upheld these kinds of, of provisions. It said that a requirement that women first be counseled on the risk and alternatives, that was considered to be appropriate, that would be allowable. And also, a waiting period, a 24-hour waiting period, states are allowed to re require a 24-hour waiting period for a woman before an abortion is performed. And also, um, in this case, there were no abortions al allowed after 24 weeks or six months. So, so again, this case here allows further restrictions by the states uh, to, again, regulate the practice of abortion. Um, in this case here, too, uh, this, uh, a new principle was enunciated called the undue burden test. And do certain practices create an undue burden on, on the, the, the woman, and if they do, then they violate uh, the right to privacy. But if they don't constitute an undue burden, they do, then that would be okay. And the idea of the waiting period, for example, did not constitute an undue burden on the, on the woman. Um, 2007, the Supreme Court upheld the Federal Partial Birth Abortion Ban, uh, an act called the Federal Part Partial Birth Abortion Ban Act, and it bans partial birth abortions, and the Supreme Court upheld that in 2007. Um, other issues that relate to privacy, a very important court case was Bowers versus Hardwick, and that occurred back in 1986, and there it said the states could enact anti-sodomy laws, and those kinds of laws were designed to ban and punish homosexual practice uh, between consenting adults, and they were not considered, uh, uh, you know, these laws were, were, that were designed to ban the practice were not considered unconstitutional. Bowers versus Hardwick allowed bans of uh, these, uh, they allowed states to enact anti-sodomy laws. Now, interesting, in 2003, Lawrence versus Texas, that was overturned. Bowers versus Hardwick was overturned in 2003 in Lawrence versus Texas. In this case, the Supreme Court declared existing uh, anti-sodomy laws in 12 states to be considered anti unconstitutional and said basically upheld the right to privacy, and so expanded the right to privacy. Um, we also think about in terms of uh, privacy, it reminds me of uh, also uh, gay marriage. And in 1996, Congress passed the Defense of Marriage Act, which defined marriage as a legal union between one man and one woman as husband and wife. And that act also permitted the states to not recognize same-sex marriage that were performed in other states. We've seen increasingly that being allowed. And so Article 4, Section 1 uh, the, uh, it deals with the full faith and credit clause of the Constitution. And basically what, what the Defense of Marriage Act is saying here is that it's saying that um, states can recognize an exception to the full faith and credit clause that they're not required to consider same-sex marriages performed in another state as being legal in that state. And again, this will be an interesting topic to see how this ends up being played out and whether or not the Supreme Court will eventually uh, hear a suit that looks at
the constitutionality of the, the Defense of Marriage Act, particularly as it applies to the full faith and credit clause. In other words, are exceptions permitted or not permitted in this area? So that'll be a very interesting area to see how that plays out. But anyway, this is probably a good time to, to conclude our discussion of uh, the various types of civil liberties. And I'm hoping that you understand in terms of these is that what the courts have really tried to do in all these issues is basically figure out an appropriate balance between on the one hand the rights of the individual versus the rights of society. What would be considered permissible versus impermissible restrictions on these basic freedoms. And then also of course to what extent uh, does the federal, uh, do, do the states have to implement provisions that were originally intended to the federal government? Okay, so a lot of interesting issues come into play and that will continue to come into play as they are considered in future court cases by the Supreme Court. So for now, this is Patrick Scott. We'll see you next time.